Welcome back to the channel, everybody. And today it's my number 25 team in my 2023 NFL Deep Dive series. It's the New England Patriots. Make sure to hit the like button and leave your comments in the comment section below. Subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss any of the videos I make in this series. And full disclosure, this is being recorded before De uh, DeAndre Hopkins has signed with anyone. Now, it does seem like this is where he's going to end up. I did not originally create the gradings on the wide receiver room and in the passing game based upon him being on the team because he's not officially on the team. I did, however, create a little extra content here where we will see uh, the effects on the rankings and the grading if they do sign him. So we will get to that uh, at some point here when we talk about the grading system for the Patriots passing game and the offense. I don't think signing him really affects the running game at all. And also, even working it out with him potentially on the team, it doesn't really change this ranking for me because I was looking at the games and, of course, I do all the record predictions and stuff. I don't know that adding him is going to add more wins to their to their overall total. They're in a, probably the hardest division right now in the NFL between them and probably the AFC West have become the two hardest divisions in football, and they are still by far the worst team in that division. Regardless of what they got going on with their coaching staff, regardless of what they got going on with some of their good defensive pieces, Jack Jones was just arrested at the airport, so he's actually removed from the starting lineup, but his grades are still being counted in as of right now as a starter, but we'll start to talk about maybe who would be coming in to replace him more. Uh, on the assumption that he's in a lot of trouble and that the Patriots don't usually tolerate this type of off-the-field issues and behavior. So there's a lot going on here in New England that is up in the air. But unfortunately, because of how many of these videos I'm doing, the series can't stop. So I'm sort of talking about what they'll look like with Hopkins, without Hopkins, with Jack Jones, without Jack Jones. Uh... Speaking of the name Jones, it's probably, this is the team that probably has the most people on it named Jones. You got Jonathan Jones, Jack Jones, Marcus Jones, Mac Jones, like, holy crap. And this is really the true test for Mac Jones, the quarterback, who there was a lot of rumors about him maybe getting traded, maybe them acquiring Aaron Rodgers, them looking to trade up to get one of the top quarterbacks. And they brought in a real offensive coordinator, Bill O'Brien. Now, I know there's a lot of controversy online about Bill O'Brien, but we'll get to that. They did sign um, a new receiver in Juju Smith-Schuster to replace Jacoby Myers. I don't know how much of an upgrade that truly is. Personally, I don't really find it to be an upgrade. They did bring in uh, Mike Gesicki to replace Jonu Smith. Uh, I think it might be in this type of uh, two tight end system that they like to run. It might be a bit of an upgrade, but Kasicki has really, outside of that year two years ago in Miami, last year was just completely absent from that offense. So it'll be interesting to see how he fits in here. They brought back a lot of the same offensive linemen. I actually really like some of the depth that they've acquired in the draft with some of those young players. A very good Patriot-style draft. And then there's the defense, the front seven, where they like to mix and match all the time. I'm just not sure that the overall talent level is there, specifically on the offensive side of the ball, to be conducive, especially in that division and in this conference, the AFC, to be a high-level team. And I think that their record, I think that in the NFC, they're much higher than the 25th ranked team. I'll say that. They're probably in the top seven, 18, 17 teams in the NFL if they were in the NFC. However, because of the division, because of their schedule, and we'll get to it, it's hard to find wins for this football team, barring a drastic overachieving or a drastic underachieving of a lot of the more projected to be top teams, at least on paper. Uh, but we'll start, as we always do, with the coaching staff. This is one of the brightest spots in this franchise, and let's get to it. So we're going to start with the coaching staff as always, and it is the number two coaching staff in the league for me. And it's really based upon Bill Belichick, who, in my opinion, is the greatest coach in NFL history. Now, is he on a bit of a downslide? It, that might be the case. 
Uh, I think last year was very eye-opening probably for him. I think that his ego really came through with how he handled specifically the offensive side of the ball. And Matt Patricia was the offensive play caller. It was just a very odd uh, decision. Uh, you know, Joe Judge was in there who's, as a Giants fan, was very uninventive for most of his time there. Uh, and it, it it was, I don't know, it was very odd. It was a very odd decision, and the team suffered greatly because of it. I think they kind of did overachieve a little bit, given the circumstances, with an extremely uninventive offense on a defense that really had to carry the load. Uh, and as you can see, I didn't really list the defensive coordinator. Uh, that's because Belichick really kind of is that guy. But he also has certain position coaches that he delegates certain powers to, specifically Steve Belichick and Gerard Mayo, who are basically the defensive coordinators, so to speak, in terms of what their responsibilities are and what their responsibilities share. Uh, they're both linebackers coaches, and they, again, they work within, they work in correlation and congregation, whatever the word is, with, with uh, Belichick. And... I actually see Gerard Mayo potentially being set up and to be a head coach probably in the next cycle. I think him and uh, Raheem Morris are the two defensive guys that are sort of being groomed and set up to be the new head coaches come 2024. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and I think that it's, it's such a well-oiled machine in how they and how they coach and the culture that they build on this on this team, they just got to start finding the talent and developing the talent. And I think that Mayo and Belichick, Steve Belichick, that is, we've seen some really good chemistry between them over the last couple of years that they've been together as the coaches on the defensive side. They've gotten more and more power as time's gone on. Of course, Bill Belichick, he's still the mad scientist, the genius of it all. Very inventive. There's always something new every year that he comes out with. There's always these like day three picks that these diamonds in the rough that he finds that end up being really, really good. Uh, you know, like the, the broken toys theory where he just finds them and he puts them in the perfect place where all of a sudden they're now great players. I think Jack Jones uh, is a perfect example of that. Uh, you know, Jonathan Jones, some of these late round guys. Now... We're going to talk about the offensive coordinator, Bill O'Brien. The hatred for Bill O'Brien really became a meme online. And this is the problem that I have a lot with uh, with social media in general, is how it creates these narratives. that And these narratives are created by people who don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand the difference between being a GM a head coach, a VP of football operations, a coordinator, a position coach. They have no idea what the difference is because they their only experience with football is maybe playing it a little bit in high school, maybe, or mostly just watching it on TV and playing Madden and thinking that they know things because they're good at Madden. I think that's mostly what it is. And it's a lot of like these really young people who just don't know anything. And that's where I think a lot of the Bill O'Brien hate comes from because he had such a terrible run towards the end in Houston where he went into that job as the Bill Belichick clone, basically. And I think that's a lot of the issues that the Bill Belichick tree has when they get hired as head coaches is that they try to recreate the environment, the culture, the style that Belichick has in New England when really no one can recreate it. Because everyone's just sort of doing it active in. I think towards the end of his run there, that's what it became. And that's what it really got exposed as. However, as when you take him out of the position of being the guy who's the general manager, the guy who's being the head coach, and he's somebody that just has to focus on the offense, focus on being creative with the play calling and play design, and let other people handle the head coaching responsibilities, the GM responsibilities... Bill O'Brien has been one of the better coaches, one of the better coordinators in the last 10, 15 years. He's 
it's his success as a quarterbacks coach, as a as a play caller, has been undeniable. You know, you just gotta look at yeah, take away that those last like two years in Houston to be able to fairly assess him. So I actually really, really like that they brought him from Alabama when he went to Alabama. I think he was the offensive coordinator in Alabama. Uh, and brought him back to be the offensive coordinator for New England just to get Mac Jones back on track. Get him a get a real offensive mind in that room who has the experience and can develop something there and and understands what Belichick wants to do and understands the culture of what's trying to be built and is somebody who, despite, I would say, for lack of a better word, proving he can't be the leader of that culture, he does have the background of being able to be an effective follower of that culture. And I think that that's what makes the signing so great. And then he's got some okay position coaches in there. Uh, I don't know how much it's all it, it's all a trickle down from Belichick, really. And I think that you you just got to buy into the culture of the New England Patriots. And I'm not sure that I think that there was way too much learning going on last year when they lost Josh McDaniel. So they had guys who had no experience coaching the offense, you know, with the play design and everything. And regardless of how great Belichick is. The defense is really where he shines. It's really where he he gets the most out of his roster is when he's focused more on the defensive side of the ball. And when they didn't have that offensive mind, they really did struggle. And I think that now we're going to see somewhat of a significant upgrade in that. The only problem is, is that they've run into a situation now where their division and their conference in general is completely out of control stacked. And they've... They've admittedly fallen behind in terms of a uh, talented roster, uh, which unfortunately a coaching staff can only do so much for. And even though they are my second coaching staff, because I think they do have the best coach of all time, they do have a very effective offensive coordinator, they do have a good defensive staff that's going to keep everything disciplined, you still need the talent level. You still need... The, the playmakers, you still need the the high-octane offense and defensive play that I'm not sure this roster can really get, but it won't be for a lack of a coaching staff and their, and their brain and their abilities and their IQs. So we'll start with the player grades here, and we'll start with the quarterback, Mac Jones. I give him a 69, nice uh, grade. He had a really good rookie year and a not-so-great sophomore year. So which one is he? It's easy to sort of point at blaming the fact he didn't have a real offensive coordinator for his down year. I think that that's fair. But at the end of the day, he wasn't somebody who was the super upside quarterback. Anyway, he was a high floor, low ceiling, don't lose us the game quarterback who was smart, who they thought could come in, read defenses right away and make the smart plays. And now with Bill O'Brien, maybe he can upgrade and go back to maybe more what he was in his rookie year. I'm just not sure that he can exceed that. Uh, There's just no sign of it. I think Bailey Zappi is sort of the, I think he gets sort of the same amount out of Bailey Zappi. I think last year sort of proved that. I think because they had such uh, instability in the offensive coaching room and the offensive play calling that it was really just based on pure talent level that we saw. And I don't think that Mac Jones and Bailey Zappi were all that different in terms of just their pure talent. Now, how they interact within the system with Bill O'Brien, who actually is going to dial in a real system here with some consistency and some creativity and some better, probably situational football. I think that's where Mac Jones is probably going to separate himself from uh, Bailey Zappi. I have Malik Cunningham written there. Likelihood is that he's going to be more on the, receiver side and probably get some special teams play but he was a quarterback in college he will be likely that third um, emergency quarterback I think you know they have Trace McSorley that they just signed as well I'm not sure that um, he makes the roster just because I think that Cunningham's versatility to sort of step into that emergency quarterback role will give him that roster spot but I just 
there's just a lot of question marks surrounding this quarterback room in general. And it's, I think it's, it's really Mac Jones's last true opportunity in his third year in the NFL. The, after this year, they have to pick up his fifth year option. If he doesn't play well, they won't do it. And they'll probably be looking for another quarterback uh, come next year. Now, something that has always been a strength of this roster that I really enjoy watching them build is the running back room. Uh, in terms of being able to turn around and hand the ball off, we got Ramondre Stevenson, who is fantastic. I give him an 84 grade. And then he's got some pretty good backups that they've drafted over the years. They seem to draft one running back every year almost. Um, they had Pierre Strong Jr. last year. They drafted, I give him a 74. And I think with Damian Harris gone, we're going to see him step up a little bit more into that role and probably play his way into being the starter next year when, and them getting rid of Stevenson. They got Kevin Harris, who I think is a pretty decent back as well. It's hard to really judge uh, what the week-to-week effectiveness is going to be of a Patriots running back room. I think Stevenson is sort of locked in as getting maybe 12 to 15 touches a game. It's what are they going to do with these other backs? Because you do have Pierre Strong who is a pretty decent backup. You have Kevin Harris, who's who's pretty good. And then you get the third down backs, which they love to use. They brought in Ty Montgomery, who's actually a converted wide receiver, who I grade a 75. He's a fantastic receiving back. You know, they can be really creative with him out of the backfield. They can line him up in the slot. They can do so many things with him. I think there's going to be, he's going to get a lot more use than people, um, maybe are anticipating it in the event he makes the team. But then, you know, Ramondre Stevenson really isn't that bad either. You know, he's a decent pass protector. You can throw a good screen pass to him. Pierre Strong, Kevin Harris, or the same thing. There's a lot of consistency in this backfield. I think really outside of making Ty Montgomery a first and second down back, there's a lot of potential. Uh, you know, if we're talking fantasy football, I'm not sure what to do with anyone outside of maybe Ramondre Stevenson as a middle of the round pick. It's, but it's not going to be, there's not going to be a lack of talent in that backfield. I think is the, I think is the the real point here. I think the developing a strong uh, run blocking offensive line will be important to them. I don't know that they have the tight end room that create, that's going to have a, good like adding that sixth offensive lineman in the running game I don't know if their receiver room has the ability to really get those outside runs blocked effectively unless you know they're mixing in um, some of the lower end talent guys but that sort of gives it away that they won't be throwing the ball so it's it's a very weird setup they have but they do have the talent in the backfield they do have a nice variety of talent they have guys who are who have dual threat ability which I think will help in the play calling and the play design and will help out Mac Jones inevitably. So we're getting to the receiver room. And again, like I said at the top, this was this is recorded before DeAndre Hopkins has signed with anyone, including the Patriots. So we're going on the assumption that he's on the team because he isn't on the team right now. Uh, we'll get to the overall grades later when I account for maybe if he does sign. But for now, this is what it looks like. Devontae Parker, the number one receiver. You got Juju and then Kendrick Bourne as the top three receivers on the roster. And then you got Hunter Henry, who looks like he's going to be the main number one true tight end. Um, Just, there's no real high end number one here. You know, Jacoby Myers, despite, again, social media, despite that one play, that boneheaded play with the Raiders, Jacoby Myers was throughout last year the most effective wide receiver on the roster the most consistent uh, and it's really been that way as he's really developed over the years and they let him go. They gave Juju basically the same contract. So clearly they see something more in Juju than they see in, in Myers and that's okay. I just think you're getting maybe a little bit less. I don't know that Juju's personality is going to fit ultimately, um, which could result in him not getting on the field as much as maybe people think, uh, but they did pay him. So he's going to get opportunities and, but he's going to have to fall in line personality-wise. Uh, Devontae Parker has never really become that number one receiver. I think that if you add DeAndre Hopkins and he's 
Devontae Parker becomes your number two, I think that does drastically change what this wide receiver room looks like because I think Parker as a number two receiver is is a high end number two. But as a number one, you just don't I don't think you're gonna get the level of production out of him that you're looking for. And we look at some of the depth here. Mike Gesicki and Hunter Henry, I sort of see them as being one of the same, just slightly different skill sets. Anthony Ferkser uh, gives you maybe a little bit more on first and second down. The one I want to talk about is Kayshawn Butte, the rookie that they got on day three. I give him a grade of 65. He's somebody that if he dials it in personality-wise, he could be really effective. It wasn't all that long ago. He was looked at as a top 10 pick potentially in the draft. And then something just happened at LSU this last year that is still a mystery to a lot of people. I think that if he buys in, keeps his nose clean, he could end up being one of the big steals of this draft, undoubtedly. Uh, He's going to get plenty of opportunities. He can come in, play in that slot role, and they can get the ball in his hands and he can be effective. Especially him, he'll be sort I believe he'll be more the backup to Juju Smith-Schuster in this offense. So it's really, you got two guys who have personality, you know, concerns and it's going to be interesting to see that dynamic happen. Uh, They drafted Tyquan Thornton last year. Who's really just a burner Uh, until he shows more than that, until he shows like solid route running ability. He's really just that guy who's going to come in and run straight down the field and be a deep threat with that speed. Now that speed is undeniable, but you also have a quarterback who doesn't necessarily have that cannon arm to use him effectively uh, in that role. So he's going to have to really work on developing his route tree uh, this off season and these mini camps and training camp uh, to see the field more, but he's going to be that guy who's sort of, again, a backup to one of the outside receivers who will get probably situational play. If there's like a a good matchup that Belichick likes uh, that he saw on film of an opponent's uh, cornerback room, I think Thornton could, have those weeks where he's on the field 60 70 percent of the time uh but i think that'll be few and far between uh because there are a lot the corners are a lot more athletic uh you know long and got the top end speed that it's going to be difficult for thornton to really take advantage of unless he develops a more uh, refined road tree uh matthew slater is always going to make the team every year He's the greatest special teams player of all time. Uh, doesn't add much in the receiving game. Uh, but he's there basically to play special teams. And I don't have a special teams designation. So what's his secondary position is wide receiver. So there you go. Now we're going to talk about the offensive line. Uh, I actually like the, like I said at the top, I like the depth of the offensive line. I think that they're a pretty solid group uh we'll start with the pass blocking you know trent brown seems to be the one that has the big question mark on him i uh, give him a 76 uh grade for pass blocking he seems to be the only true left tackle uh cool strange uh his strength is going to be pass blocking he really needs to develop as a run blocker we'll get to that david andrews sort of the opposite uh, i like him much better in the run game than the pass game but you know as a center if the center is your worst pass blocker you're okay because uh, a lot of what they're doing is assisting on double teams, picking up a linebacker that's blitzing, and I think Andrews has a good I has a good IQ for picking that up, and he's got a lot of experience. I just think that if you line up a nose tackle who's maybe super effective with some good pass rushing moves, he might get exploited a little bit. Uh, Michael Owen, who is their best offensive lineman, he gets an 83 passing grade, and they signed Riley Reef uh, as the Isaiah Wynn replacement uh, at right tackle. He's had some okay years. He's nowhere near, I think, top end. I think you should be in a constant state of trying to replace him, but he's that guy that you bring in for that one-year spot duty while maybe you got somebody developing behind him. And for me, when we look at the depth here, I think that guy is going to be um, either like a City Sal or Antonio Mafi. I say that um, because they... We'll get to their ability as as run blockers later. There's some decent depth here. They drafted three guys. You know, City Sal is written in as an interior guy. I think he's more of a swing off uh, 
sixth offensive lineman type. Mafi's probably more of a guard. Maybe you can kick him out to tackle. Maybe you kick a Wenu out to tackle and put Mafi at guard. We'll get to that. Uh, McDermott in pass blocking is not great. I think he's a fantastic run blocker, though. Might be the best run blocker on the team. Uh, Jake Andrews as a rookie. You don't really know what you're going to get from him in the passing game. Uh, as we get to the run blocking, this is where the tackle group sort of falls off a bit for me. Trent Brown and Riley Reef, uh, much better in the passing game. A win who's a little bit better as a pass blocker than a run blocker. I think he's pretty much going to be the same. Cole Strange really needs to get some work in there. I think that's going to be um, a real focus for him this offseason. At least I hope it is. Uh, and David Andrews, uh, very, very effective run blocker from the center position. But the depth is really where I like this offensive line. Because we look at the depth for the run blocking, and you got Connor McDermott, who's probably the best run blocker on the team. He's extremely effective when he got on the field last year in run blocking scenarios, was just terrible with pass blocking. Uh, Antonio Maffi was a fantastic run blocker last year in college. So is City Sal and Jake Andrews. Both, I think, can make cases for that as well. I think Maffi was just so high end. I think that's really why he ended up getting drafted um, where he did. Because uh, he was always sort of looked at as like a late day three pick because his uh, pass blocking was sort of not great. And the league sort of favors a pass blocker over a run blocker. But I wouldn't be shocked at all throughout the season. Maybe we see, you know, Riley Reef might find his way to the bench. Um, if Trent Brown, that's that doesn't really work out. Maybe Michael Owenu goes to left tackle and Mafi will come in as his replacement at guard. Maybe it's City Sal. Maybe, you know, I don't know if it's Jake Andrews. I think he's just too poor uh, in pass blocking. So it's going to be, and we know the the Patriot way is next man up. The best guys will play. We don't we don't care what their name value is. We don't care when they were drafted, if they were drafted, what con what their contract looks like. This is the one team that truly, on a week to week basis, the best guys are going to play. So how these rookies, in particular, uh, how that shapes out for them. It's a crapshoot. They could all they could all get cut. As like they're just as likely, really, to me, just the way that Bill Belichick runs his roster, they're just as likely to get cut and practice squatted as they are to be Week One starters. So it, it's really up to them. And there's no better organization for a late round player to go to to get a legitimate opportunity to get on the field and to prove themselves in the Patriots. So I think there's a lot of benefit here for these three interior offensive linemen. So just taking a quick run at the position summaries for the offense. A very average pass offense, probably below average pass offense in terms of just their overall talent level. There's no position group that stands out at all. Uh, the depth, they they have a good job of creating some depth, I guess, in comparison to how good their starters are. Like their receiving back depth, their wide receiver depth, their tight end depth is all sort of, it all looks about the same. When you get into the run game, you know, the other running back room really stands out. It's your ability to turn around, hand the ball off. There's really nothing else going on, though. And I think that that is the ultimate downfall. Uh, if they get some great production, if Cole Strange really develops into a strong run blocker, then I think that that can drastically change the ranking here and drastically change the grade. Probably get that run blocking grade into the 70s, which will boost them uh, significantly on their average. So this is the offensive summary without DeAndre Hopkins. They are the 30th offense in the NFL, 29th passing offense, 27th rushing offense. This is without DeAndre Hopkins. Assum assuming the roster stays the same and this Hopkins doesn't end up there, this is what it's going to look like. Not great. <laughs> Not very good at all. However... A guy like DeAndre Hopkins, who I'm very high on, can make a significant difference. And this is the difference that he can make. He boosts the passing offense to 21st in the NFL. Which boosts the overall offense to 27th. Now, 
three three whole spots for overall offense, and I believe how many is that? Eight spots for the overall pass offense. I think there is, and in in general, I think that that also will help with the improvements and the development of Mac Jones, which I think the effects of having a DeAndre Hopkins will have more long-term benefits than perhaps short-term benefits because there is still a lot that needs to be developed on this roster that I don't think can be done throughout the season, throughout the training camp. I don't think that DeAndre Hopkins is going to be that much of a difference maker in terms of their ability to get wins. He might add an extra maybe 30 yards of offense a game when you account for the targets he'll get in comparison to other people. You know, if if the number one receiver on the team is Devontae Parker and he's getting 55 yards a game, DeAndre Hopkins will probably account for 80 to 90 yards a game. But how much how much does is that taking away from other people on the team? How much how much extra is he really adding in terms of yards and production to this offense? It's hard to really measure that. Uh, I th- in just terms of overall position and grades and player grades, it does make a significant difference for the passing offense. It just doesn't make an overall difference to where this team is going to finish probably wins wise uh, and where the offense ranks in comparison to all these other offenses in the league. So now we're going to get to the pass rush here. Uh, and it's, it's a good group. It's a really good group. It's a versatile group. Uh, we got the edge guys, which is Judon and Uche, uh, who I who I like. I like that one-two punch there. Uh, when you get to the interior guys, this is where, again, the Patriot way, it's like, who's going to be the guys? I think Christian Barmore sort of has that locked in. Uh, he's the best interior defensive lineman on the roster, I think, overall, and he gets an 80 pass rushing grade. And then I got Dietrich Wise kicking inside. Uh to be a second interior guy on these passing downs. Uh, I think that there's a lot of moving around that you can do with a lot of these guys. Maybe you can put Judon in maybe like a four eye technique and then uh, wise plays like a, a five. There's, there's a lot of different things you can do. You can sort of use Matt Judon the way that uh, Zadarius Smith gets used. I think Zadarius Smith has a little bit more versatility to kick inside of course, but Judon, I think, has a, a great ability to be versatile as well. I think Josh Uche is just a straight-up uh, pass rusher from the edge. Uh, and then you get to the depth. They drafted Keon White, who is sort of Dietrich-wise. They're hoping has a bit maybe more upside in being a three-down uh, defensive lineman. Uh, Anthony Jennings is really just a... A run, uh, a run stuffing specialist there, a good edge setter. Uh, hasn't really offered much uh, on passing downs as much as he has in the run. Uh, Ronnie Perkins just kind of got lost in a rotation where he hasn't really had the opportunities to develop. And I think that is really an issue uh, with the way the Patriots sort of run their defense. Uh, is that it takes a lot longer for these guys to develop because there's just the opportunities are less and less because so much of what they're doing is situational. I think that Keon White could be could also fall victim to that the same way Ronnie Perkins has. You look at the interior though, there's not really a lot going on with the interior in terms of a pass rush here. You got Carl Davis who could maybe step in a bit, but I don't love any of the other guys on the interior pass rush, that's for sure. So now we're looking at the D-line with against the run, and this is where Anthony Jennings finds his way into the field of the 78. And then the other three, all 69s, nice. Uh, Barmore and Godchow uh, with Matthew Judon uh, off the edge. Now, they do like this multiple 3-4 fronts. So that's when we go and take a look at some of their depth pieces, which I think is really... Uh, where this Patriot defense, this Belichick style defense comes 
into play where they, it's a lot of mix and matching going on. So you look at some of the edge guys. Keon White still gets a 67 grade for me. Uche is not really effective on – he's more of a pass rushing specialist, so he'll get those third down reps. Perkins, Dietrich Wise, don't really like him on running downs either. Uh, then on the interior is, again, you know, Uke – Ukale could come in. I think Lawrence Guy is awful. <laughs> Somehow he keeps getting paid. Somehow he keeps getting good uh, overall grades in Madden. I don't get it. Uh, Carl Davis, again, sort of like Uche, but for the interior version, more of a pass rushing guy. Uh, so I think that we could see Keon White finding his way onto the field as like a 3-4 defensive end. Um. And taking advantage of the fact that he can be a, he can be almost equally effective against the pass and the run, so I think that could be where he sort of finds his way into a majority of his snaps. Is like a three four defensive end type of a role to start because he is like two eighty five two ninety almost, so he does have the size, and he does have and he does have the ability against the run to sort of hold up. Uh, and I think that having an effective edge guy, um to his left or to his right, depending on what side he wants to play on, where they want him to play on, whether it be Uche, whether it be uh, Matthew Judon. I think it'll open up some opportunities for him, perhaps. And I think that he will get more opportunities than Ronnie Perkins has. I just think that, again, because of the way the Patriots sort of do things, you're in a position where you need to, on a week-to-week basis, really perform in those film rooms in those practice situations in order to get on the field. So Keon White does have his work cut out for him, but I think he's going to get opportunities. Now we're going to the linebackers. And this is, again, almost a specialty of the Patriots. Uh, you got Juwan Bentley and Jelani Tavai, who are sort of six to one, half dozen to the other as linebackers against the pass. I think that they also have some safeties that they've drafted and some defensive backs that they've signed that can also fill like a money backer type role in the passing game. So again, like a healthy rotation, a lot of depth, a lot of versatility is sort of what the Patriots bank themselves on. Uh, and they drafted a guy, Marte, uh, Marte Mapu, I guess is how you pronounce his name, uh, who gets a greatest 64 in the pass game, but he's undersized. He's like, oh, he's going to be basically a converted safety to linebacker. Almost like a Jabril Peppers, who's also on this roster. Um, So it'll be interesting to see how he gets used. He's actually pretty good against the run as well. Um, How his size will affect that in the move to linebacker will be interesting. Maybe they'll use him in the run game more like how we see Isaiah Simmons. Because he he is smaller than Isaiah Simmons. So we will say that. He's not even... He's smaller than some of the defensive backs on this roster. So he may have put on some, some size... Uh, to be more effective uh, when we go to the run game Juwan Bentley fantastic uh, run uh, run stuffing linebacker great gap discipline uh, July Tavai again just solid just a solid number two uh, but this is where you'll see more opportunities for a guy like Chris Board um, Martin Mapu uh, <laughs> just a funny name you know, talk about winning the the name Olympics for the draft. Uh, Mac Wilson, I, you know, two poor grades for against the pass against the run. He hasn't really done a whole lot. He had like an okay uh, one year in Cleveland. It was like his first or second year, but other than that, hasn't really worked out. And when you're on the Patriot team, you know, you you're Alabama. Uh, <laughs> alma mater status can only get you so far uh but i think that uh, Marte mapu is going to have an opportunity in the run game as well uh just from a versatility standpoint so now we're going to talk about the defensive backs and pass coverage and again i do have jack jones listed so we'll get to that when we get to the depth thing but his arrest with the guns is just not um it's not looking good for him because he's a Patriot. We'll say that. They did draft Christian Gonzalez, who gets a 69 grade. Nice. Uh, they got Jonathan Jones and Marcus Jones there, uh, 68 and 67. Uh, Kyle Duggar gets a 70 grade for me. And then Jabril Peppers gets a 66 grade. But much like 
a lot of the position groups here, uh, the depth is really where it shines through. Now, Jack Jones plays. He is a solid corner. Uh, and coming into his second year, the development that he could have, that second year leap, it could be significant. They also got Adrian Phillips, who can be sort of a third um, safety. Jalen Mills, who they keep keeps getting paid. I don't get it. He's probably going to see the field quite a bit for whatever reason. I don't. I don't get it. I don't get it. He stinks. Uh, you know, Miles Bryant, special teams player. Sean Wade is more of a, um, I definitely spelled Sean wrong. My apologies. Uh, but he's more of that nickel specialist. You know, he was looked at as a first round pick when he came to the league, never really developed as an outside corner, got sort of burnt like toast in some pretty important games, uh, playing on the outside and then didn't really show any real strong development as a nickel guy. So, He's sort of just sitting there as a death piece. Joshua Bledsoe, the same thing, at least in the passing game aspect for Bledsoe. Now we're going to look at this uh, defensive back group and run support. And Christian Gonzalez is actually deceptively physical. I think he's a pretty. He doesn't really lose a lot in run support. I think he'll he'll step up, make some tackles. Jonathan Jones, uh, same thing. Marcus Jones, you know, got a bit of a special teams edge to him, so he he really embraces contact. Uh, Kyle Duggar and Jabril Peppers are both, you know, bigger, more physical safeties in general. Peppers against the run, though, I think is top notch. Uh, you know, you can come up, put him in the slot. You can put him at linebacker. Uh, he's super versatile. He's sort of the original Isaiah Simmons when you look back at it. Uh, and then even with their depth, Jack Jones, not much in the run game. But Miles Bryant as a special teams guy, he's somebody that you can put in uh on defense in the running situations. Uh, Adrian Phillips, sort of the same thing. Uh, big physical safety. Jalen Mills, again, like I said, I don't get it. He'll play, though, more than Joshua Bledsoe will, even though they're basically the same in pass coverage at this point, and Bledsoe I like better uh, against the run just because he has the special teams experience, so he you know, doesn't shy away from the physicality of it. Um, but we'll like, but we'll probably get cut. In favor of Jalen Mills for whatever reason. They I don't know what he must have some sort of blackmail on like everyone in the NFL, the fact that he keeps getting paid and keeps getting playing time. <laughs> Cause I haven't seen I haven't seen a consistent level of even average play from Jalen Mills ever. Ever. Even going back to his time with the Eagles. So I don't whatever. Whatever. <laughs> so taking a look at the position summary and the front the front four, the defensive line against the pass is very good. Uh, even incorporating uh, the safeties into that and the corners and linebackers, I think it's a pretty solid group. I don't think that they're elite by any means, but they have a good group. Uh, even against the run, it's a little bit worse than against the pass, but I think they can scheme their way. Uh, and how, they, how they're going to mix and match guys, I think that's that's also the key too is how are you going to mix and match guys based upon what your opponent is doing, based upon what your opponent's skill sets are? How are you going to how are you going to use that? Is does does the opposing team's interior not do well against speed, then maybe you're going to go a little bit smaller even on even on uh, running downs on first down and second down. You know, are they much are they much larger and do they do they not do well against power? Then you might be a little bit bigger. So you might lose a little bit in terms of pass rushing moves, but you'll gain a lot in collapsing pockets. It's it's really it's a hard it's hard to predict because it is truly a week to week thing when it comes to who the Patriots play, especially on the defensive side of the ball. So taking a look at the overall defensive summary, they have the 16th best defense in the NFL. They're right smack dab in the middle. Uh, the 19th pass defense. Um, just because you know there's so much, um, so much that's unsure about what they're even going to be doing uh, with Jack Jones right at the moment, but this is assuming Jack Jones is going to play. So I think that they'll find ways around it. If he doesn't, I think Christian Gonzalez has a huge opportunity to significantly outplay the grade that I gave him, uh, and they got a middle of the pack run defense as well. Uh, I think. They just need to develop some talent. They 
they might need they might be a couple pieces away frankly still from getting into that top 10 defense uh, and I don't know that the talent level they have right now I mean if Jack Jones plays and then has a good has a repeat at least of last year and then Christian Gonzalez plays sort of the way Jack Jones did last year which was really really which was really good then they might actually be able to get that pass defense into like the top 15 Taking a look at the record prediction here, and this is what I'm talking about. Like even adding DeAndre Hopkins, where does the where are these extra wins going to come from? It's just, it. They don't match up well against Miami, even with Hopkins. They don't match up well against the Jets, even with Hopkins. They don't match well against the Eagles or the Cowboys, uh, even against Buffalo. Maybe against maybe against Pittsburgh, they match up a little bit better. Uh, I don't know against Kansas City or Denver. I don't know against Buff. Like, so where are these extra wins coming from? Even with DeAndre Hopkins, I don't think. It's just, I just don't think they exist. Like, they could maybe catch the Jets or Buffalo or Miami. Like, they can catch someone in their division maybe once or twice. Maybe their high end for wins is seven. But I don't know that adding Hopkins makes much of a difference. This is, and that's what I mean by like, I don't like. Okay, it's more of a long term. Uh, benefit than it is a short-term benefit for this team i i just don't i don't see it i don't see where these extra wins will be coming from uh even even the wins i have giving them like against new orleans and the chargers that's no guarantee you know i think they can beat vegas i think they can beat washington obviously i think they can beat the colts uh, especially because the colts are probably going to be playing a rookie quarterback uh by the time they get to that game it's still, it, like, it's not a guarantee. None of these, none of these are home runs. There's a lot of, I think, ones where you look at, where you're like, they're for sure losing. I don't know if there's a whole lot you're looking at here and going there for sure winning. It's a tough, it's a tough schedule for them, um, for them this year. So just an overall summary of what we got: five and twelve, last in the division, though there's no shame in that. Fourteenth in the conference, twenty fifth in the league. They have the second best coaching staff. Uh, 30th offense, 29th against the pass, 27th against the run, uh, 16th run defense, 19th pass defense for 16th total defense. And then even with DeAndre Hopkins, the pass offense goes up to 21st and the total offense goes up to 27th. Still not a significant, uh, improvement in total offense. And like we just touched upon with the schedule, no real opportunities to steal a significant amount of wins to make much of a difference in terms of where they'll finish in the overall scheme of things. And there you have it, my 25th ranked team, the New England Patriots. Thank you for making it this far. Make sure to hit the like and the subscribe on this video. Leave your comments in the comment section below. Is Diop going to be here? Is he already here? Is Jack Jones released? Is Jack Jones suspended? What is happening with New England? What is going on? Uh, I hope that there's a little bit more clarity uh, down the line, but hopefully not too soon. So this video almost becomes a slightly more obsolete, even though I kind of accounted for it. I think I did a good job accounting for the impending variables that this roster could face. And I will see you guys with the next video when we do the number 24 team. Maybe it's already done. Maybe it isn't. If it is, it's right there. If it's not, then just check out the other videos in the playlist. All right. Thanks.